my interest is in heat and cold stress, both, you know, as far as the, the entire spectrum and environmental stress. I worked in that area for 25, 30 years, and I do some work internationally as well as in the U.S. I'm going to just show you some few introductory slides relative to what, to the best of my ability, I could document the losses we have observed or seen with beef cattle, some dairy here, but whenever we have Whenever we have livestock that perish, carrot cattle that perish in, in, in snowstorms or under heat episodes, I mean, we also have the spectrum with, we have dairy animals, we have poultry houses that go down, we have swine units if they don't have good ventilation. So in, anyway, this is, not, this is not just a beef cattle issue or a problem. But these are some numbers I've put together over the years as far as the losses that we've experienced. Uh, in the central and northern plains, I don't have data from the southern plains, but they are, they are significant, um, and they tend to occur in, in different areas. Uh, but in likewise, in the winter, we also experience those losses. It's different, and in some ways, it's even more catastrophic. The numbers are higher. Uh, but it, it is usually associated with a significant snowstorm. This was the blizzard in the, the early October blizzard in South Dakota. Most of these uh, 25,000 uh, deads are in the southern plains, uh, Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas area. Again, uh, enormous amounts of snow uh, accompanying uh, w uh, high wind conditions. And so, so we, we are experiencing these and they aren't going away. Uh, the more we uh, push cattle or livestock to perform better, uh, to try to get everything out of them we can, fine tune that management system, but they probably are, have less ability to buffer against the environment uh, when we're pushing them that hard. And when we do have these catastrophic events, we not only have a lot of animals that die, we have a lot of animals that are suffering. As far as heat stress, this is a, a graph showing the, and I'm not going to get into the THI per se, uh, a graph of where the, the worst heat event tends to, to, to be associated in, in the, this is the, the uh, four state area. As you move south and east, you tend to see a greater number of THI hours in the summer. Again, this, this here is a little bit of anomaly. You can move over here and move into Arkansas. We don't see a lot of cattle fed in these areas. We do see a little bit. But as again, as you go north and west, we have less problem with heat stress. But that being said, we sometimes can have pretty high numbers of deads in these areas because when we get these weather anomalies where we have sudden changes in the temperature or temperature humidity, particularly in areas where animals haven't experienced those weather conditions before, it can be much more catastrophic than maybe some, some of these places here. This is kind of an example. Uh, this is 2011 where we lost about 15,000 head. And normally we're always going to see Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas have hot weather, but this moved all the way up into the northern plains, lost a lot of cattle in South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa parts of, uh, of, of Nebraska. Now this is the average temperature change from normal and so again we can talk about normal or we can talk about a particular weather pattern uh, but if we just have a slow gradual uh, a sustained increase in our temperature or weather conditions these animals they'll acclimate they'll adapt and typically the way they do it they just quit eating they eat less feed. You lower the metabolic heat load you can, you can better manage the environmental heat load. But when you have these changes, and that's why I put the change here, when you have these departures from normal or departures from average, that's where we really get our high losses. And even in 2010, we lost about 2,500 head of cattle down in this area. It's just a little isolated area, but again, it was enough of a change that those animals couldn't um, tolerate it. This is my one climate change slide, I call it climate variability, uh, and I put this together several years ago. We always experience cold weather or cold stress in this region, heat stress in this region. This line here, as you move east, 
the precipitation uh, is greater than evaporation if you move west, it's a negative water balance. If I have the choice to raise livestock in general, I would raise them in an area where I have, don't have to deal with humidity, I don't have to deal with mud, I don't have to deal with wet animals or wet cattle or uh, anything that can contribute to upsetting the environmental cycle of that animal. So it's, I can always produce him under normal, average, uniform conditions. However, the problem with doing that is your feed's going to cost you more. It's going to cost a lot more to bring that feed in or whatever you need, corn, because you can't grow it there. But generally, a drier environment is much more conducive to maintaining a more uniform environment for livestock production. This little line here, I just, this used to be the old line, but over time in the last last decade or so, I've moved that back a little bit as far as that heat stress region, because we are experiencing more heat stress in the, these areas today than what we were uh, 20 uh, years or so. Our death loss, again, we're, we're producing animals, raising animals uh, genetically that can have greater output today than, than ever before. With that, have fire, higher feed intakes, we have greater metabolic heat loads. These animals are the ones that are going to be most susceptible uh, to particularly heat stress, not so much on cold stress, because that metabolic heat load will mitigate that. But feedlot animals, dairy confined animals. But even today, we're seeing more, I'm getting more calls of animals dying because of heat stress in pastures out on range. And 15 years ago, I never had a one. But the last, last three years, I've had three or four of those where either it's been yearlings or cows uh, that it, it typically associated with the water problem where they don't have access to water or something's going on there. But, but again, it's a situation where we're hearing more of today than in the, in the past. And of course, it's non-discriminating and we will, it will cost us on, on uh, reproduction uh, if the uh, heat episode is severe enough. This is a, a scale, the panning score, and Temple mentions this quite a bit in her presentations, the use of it relative to trying to identify when animals are under varying degrees of stress, when cattle are under varying degrees of stress, because it's pretty obvious. But the thing I really watch for, I got a scale, but the thing that I really look for in the feedlot or even cattle out on range is when, when they're when they're experiencing heat stress, they'll have an increased or elevated respiration rate. But in that process, they won't swallow as much or it'll really interrupt that, that swallowing process. And so then they'll start to form a little bit of drool. So at about a panning score of two, you, if you start seeing that little drool coming out of the side of the mouth or a little bit of foam, well, then you're in, you're starting into that, what I would call the next phase of heat stress. Elevated respiration rate, elevated panning rate is really not that, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's important, but it's not that big of an issue relative to how much stress that animal is experiencing. But when he quits swallowing and starts, you start seeing that drool, well, then I usually tell feedlot managers or cattle livestock managers that, that this is a time they need to start implementing some type of emergency or mitigation practice, particularly if you start seeing this at 10 in the morning or sometime in the mornings. It's a pretty horrific way to die, whether you're animal or human, whatever. And I, I think I, we, just, we just don't take this serious enough. We just don't, and, it, and I think it is, a, it is, well, we all know it's a very serious animal welfare concern, but from a consumer perception standpoint, it's huge. In the initial stages, and I'm not a DVM, and I don't do knee, knee, uh, necropsies, degriffin did these, but again, we see a lot of hemorrhaging in the thoracic cavity. Um, these animals, they get de dehydrated at 108 or thereabouts, blood starts to coagulate, um, uh, they eventually die, respiratory collapse, 
heat stroke, essentially. Um, and if they survive that first day or that first onslaught, they may make it through the night and they actually may cool down. That body temperature may cool down. But if the, the, heat, if the heat stress was significant enough, uh, they'll lack coordination, they'll show signs of a tremor, can't get up, and that animal will probably die sometime that next day. And so again, we see this time after time in our, in our, in our feedlot setting. So again, it's just, it's just not a very, just not a very good way to, 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 to pass on. As far as uh, some of the factors, um, again, most of you are aware of this: the unhealthy, previously sick, dark-hided. I'll show you some some data on that. Dark-hided cattle will have a. We can take a black animal on a sunny day. His hide, the, the surface temperature will be about 120 degrees. A white animal will be about what am, ambient temperature is as far as the surface temperature would be about 100 degrees. High producing uh, water, a big component of maintaining that animal and keeping him alive or comfortable. Uh, obviously, endified infected grasses and pastures are a problem. Uh, because of the restrictions on the on the uh, cardiovascular system, and of course environmental conditions. So I'll get into some mitigation strategies, and again, a lot of these apply across species, uh, and certainly to the cow calf sector. And again, shade nothing unique about shade; it just cuts down on the solar solar component. And again, that can, as far as feels like, that can mean as as much as 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit both for animals and, and for humans as far as that goes. This is old slide, 1963, but still fairly applicable. As I look at data across the U.S. from either feedlot data or, or animals that are on pasture, and there's not, there's not volumes of data in this area, but there are bits and pieces we can put together. Again, uh, Louisiana, Texas, we always get a nice shade response tend to get a good shade response. As you get out of this area here, not so much. We still can get one. The question I have from producers, well, is it economical to put up shade and maintain shade? It may be here in Lubbock or in College Station, uh, but when you start doing the math for th three months out of the year, when you get into Kansas, Nebraska, parts of Missouri, it's 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 not going to happen. Strict based on strictly performance criteria. Now, if you happen to be in an area where you have a catastrophic loss, well, yeah, then it's going to pay. But but basically, uh, we don't get that big a bump from shade. We can we can get them through that period, and those that didn't get shaded and survive, they'll compensate a little bit. But for the most part, it's pretty hard to get it get it to pay. Now that's from a, from a economic performance standpoint. It's not from necessarily a consumer or public perception standpoint. But there are there are areas. There's some there's some data. Uh, Zen has some data out of Southern California. Looks good. There's some data out of Lubbock that looks pretty good relative to the benefits of shade. But I'm not talking about it just from a performance standpoint. This is what shade can do. Uh, these are surface temperatures, and we, we repeated this more or less in, in uh, Nebraska, and this is again old data, but again in the sun, these surface temperatures, this is California, they'll uh, get up to 150 degrees. So not only is that animal experiencing the solar radiant heat from the sky, he's also getting it from the ground, He's also getting it from other animals. So there's no, you get in these situations, there's, there's no heat sink for these animals, particularly in the, when they're in an outdoor, outside environment. Even though they can spread out some, there's just no, there's no way they can dissipate that heat. I did the math, and um, if you look at the amount of heat that animal is generating from, 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 from what he's eating, if he couldn't dissipate any heat, let's say at noon, he could be completely comfortable. But if there wasn't any air movement or any way for him to get rid of that heat, by six o'clock that night, he could be dead. 
and we actually have seen some of those situations not exactly show themselves that way, but we'll have animals that will go through a cool night, load up on feed the next morning, and by 8 o'clock that night they're dead. So it does happen. A lot of different ways to configure shade. This is kind of got a little chimney effect here, get air movement through there. This is an Australian slide. And it does work, it is effective. It does cost to maintain and keep up, uh, particularly in areas where we have snow load. Some interesting things here. A lot of animals crowded under, under here, where this here is not so much. And so again, we need to allow plenty of space for these animals. I just wanted to note this little poor little little creature here, you know, and I've seen this probably 20 different times driving around the country. There will be some animal, he'll have his head, just his head, buried in some sliver of shade somewhere just to try to take advantage of that because, again, that's, that's the primary sensory area as far as uh, what he, he's experiencing. And chances are he's not very dominant animal, and so he's low in the pecking order, and so this is where he ends up. Uh, but shade in itself can decrease body temperature one to three degrees if it, if it is hot enough out. There's an, another shade configuration. Um, I really showed this because of the weather station. Any, anybody anywhere that has significant numbers, and I'm not going to define significant, but have significant numbers of livestock around needs a weather station on the, on the place to monitor weather conditions. Uh, but I like I like this area where the shade where they have some open spaces here to allow air to move through, and that dries the ground under underneath it. The problem with shade, if it's solid, we tend to have animals go water, come back to the shade, urinate, you know, keep doing that process. So after a while, you, it may be, it could be feel like 120 out outside under away from the shade, but underneath the shade, it's just a mud hole, and this is this is a big problem in uh, in uh, Arizona with the uh, with the Holsteins. Here's a little more elaborate structure where we look at shelter uh, and shade and this would be both for winter and summer. You could utilize this and there's there's other ways. I'm not going to show the bedded barns. We're seeing bedded barns come up in eastern Nebraska being built in Iowa different places and they have some utility to help uh, mitigate both heat stress and cold stress. Again, pretty elaborate, uh, but again, in the open plains, typically, uh, if we have good weather spring and fall, you will not get any better performance than having those animals out there on that bare ground, walking to water or walking to feed. You can't, you can't get better performance by building a building to put them in. The more you try to, to, to compact them or get them closer together for confine or for management purposes uh, t doesn't necessarily enhance performance. Sprinkling, um, we've done quite a bit of sprinkling work. Uh, awesome tool. You get cattle wet or animals, humans, you put water on them, allow the air to evaporate to moisture, you can take, you can take a lot of heat away from that body. The problem with it, it's quite addictive. And you get them adapted to that, and it only takes one or two sprinklings for it to happen. You better keep doing it. Better keep doing it every day, or every time the animal gets hot, until that heat episode or that heat event um, uh, leaves the area or diminishes. Because you, um, you can get these animals set up to where, again, they will perish quicker than other animals if you don't get them on a, a, on a certain day at a certain time. And I've seen three situations where this occurs. Two of them were during the county fair where people left the farm, went to the fair, didn't turn the sprinklers on, came back and they had 200 head of dead cattle in their feed yard. One of them, another one was they had too much, uh, too much demand for the water with the sprinklers and the, and the watering systems and the, one of the wells went down so they couldn't get water to all the animals. This, again, not a lot of numbers. This is a Texas study where they looked at shade. Mist is fine droplets, not a lot of water, roughly five gallons per head, and then they used a sprinkler. 
where you can't really get these cattle in close confinement in, in a, or enclosed area where you can get water on them. We don't get that bigger response from sprinklers in the pen setting per se. Uh, mist even less. Shade give us the best best benefit as far as gain. Feed efficiency it's pretty much a wash. A little bit better here. And so again, it's a situation where yeah, it depends on you know as far as the benefits. It depends on what you're trying to measure. Is it performance? Is it is it animal welfare? Uh, uh, what, what your, what's your criteria? However, like I said earlier, sprinkling uh, will will work if you can get it on the animal. This is these are data we collected in Australia several years ago, where we had these animals in metabolism stalls. We just put a sprinkler head up above, and we could just run water on them. And these are the cattle that were sprinkled. Sprinkled. These were were not. So again, we're up to 105 in body temperature here at the same time we drop these down to, to 101, 102. So, you know, where I've seen sprinklers, or actually I've seen them work best within a dairy setting in Argentina. They brought the cattle in before they went into the milking parlor and they got them in pretty close confinement and they had sprinklers everywhere above those animals wetting them down. They did that three times, three times a day and then their milk Milk output was up about 15% on the average. Now we, so we looked at sprinklers, you know, weren't, wasn't too crazy about that response. And so uh, uh, I don't know exactly how we got onto this, but we just put little sprink ground sprinklers here in the fence line. This is at our research unit and just sprinkled the mounds. This picture is actually taken a day after we sprinkled. So these cattle would come to this area and stand in that area. The, the, until that water evaporates off of that surface, that ground will stay relatively cool. It'll stay close to ambient temperature. So this could be maybe 90 or 100 degrees, where over here where we're not getting water will be about 140. So those animals, they'll come to that area and they'll stand there and then eventually, and and I know how we got onto that because one, we put uh, we put shade up one year, and we couldn't figure out why cattle wouldn't come up, get under the shade on hot days. Well, they were at the back of the pen until all that moisture evaporated off the back of that pen, off the surface. They wouldn't move up to the shade. Once that dried out back there, they came to the shade. So they were getting some benefit uh, from that cool surface. Uh, bedding, uh, you can use bedding under, in cold stress and bedding under heat stress. Dan Thompson, he, he recommended this and he has some data that supports the use uh, and it will insulate that ground to a certain extent. Uh, but again, if you, if you put bedding on that ground during the day, it's not going to allow that heat to escape off that surface at night. So there are some problems with that. Plus you put the bedding in, you got to haul the bedding out. If there's one thing you could do to keep the animal alive and under reasonably feeling reasonably comfortable is get water in him. One way that if you can get cool at least cool water in that animal, uh, we I've found in in both here and in Australia it's pretty hard to raise to get that animal to a very high level of stress. And you can I don't have the slide. I think five gallons of water at, at 60 or 65 degrees will, will lower body temperature of 800 pound steer by one, de, one degree Fahrenheit, and that's significant. So again, if you can get 10 gallons, that's enough to keep in life. The problem with our watering devices today, particularly in the feedlot, is there's not enough area around that water for all those animals to get to. So again, it gets be a matter of competition and the dominant animals occupy that space. So you got dead animals by the water, you're probably pretty sure that they couldn't get to that water. So generally, we recommend about three quarters of linear inch of water space per animal. In the summer, if we could get it, we can design for it or, or set more tanks in, if we can get that to two to three inches, to allow every animal, if I can allow every animal access to water whenever he wanted it, it's pretty hard for him to succumb to the heat stress. 
Other, other issues as far as contributing factors, flies, body condition, again, we try to keep these animals away from windbreaks, any structures that will limit air movement, processing, coat color, uh, Again, in the northern plains where we have these rapidly changing conditions, we can see problems and then uh, that are related to lack of adaptation and then metabolic heat load. Uh, these, are, uh, these are tympanic temperatures from animals. These are control cattle. Uh, this actually was conducted, we did this study in the winter, about 30, 35 degrees. Let the animals out of the feed yard, out of the pen, let them run down, let them go down to the working facilities. They actually run down. You can do this study on yourself and, and get a similar response if you can get on a treadmill and really, really work, work it out. Uh, but you can elevate body temperature fairly quickly. Once you get those muscles going, elevate body temperature. Again, you got that core heated up. It's slow to release that that heat and so again it so we we let them out in the morning they run down went through the working facilities come back to the pen and then we did the same thing that afternoon but I've seen this in probably probably four or five different studies whenever we heat an animal up more often than not they will they will want to drive that temperature down to compensate somehow for this elevated temperature here to where they'll drive it down below what would be normal, typically normal. I think this is a mechanism, a survival mechanism to, to, to help them get ready for if, if they've got to do it again or it's going to happen again or whatever might happen again. But anyway, this is a pretty, pretty typical response where we see these body temperatures go below what maybe, maybe normal would be. This is, uh, this is body temperature, tympanic temperature of a dark-hided animal, summer afternoon. This would be average of several animals over several days, 104 versus 103 here, or 102.7. So again, just the, the radiant heat uh, coming down on the animal, raising body temperature. And this is another study we conducted in Australia. I've got two, two or three more similar to this here. We, conducted in the U.S. This was kind of a unique design. These cattle were full fed, a high energy diet. These cattle were limit fed, that high energy diet, at about 92 to 93 percent of the intake of these. So that dropped body temperature about a three quarters of a degree. Then we designed this diet it's a high roughage diet, well, a higher roughage diet. These are about 6% roughage. This is about 20% roughage. We designed that to be fed at a calculated ME intake, the same ME intake as these cattle. But we didn't get the same response. Well, at 20% roughage, you're still not getting as much fiber digested. So we really didn't have the same metabolic intake. We just had a lower metabolic heat load because we didn't digest that fiber. So, so now, and this has been very controversial, I had, I had a consultant call a producer. He called the governor. The governor called the dean, and they said, Mater's all wet. This can't be. It just it isn't what we were taught. It didn't go along with the, with the concept of heat increment. This is about 20 years ago. They didn't fire me, I kept my job and I kept doing the research. But anyway, the con but the deal is, is we're not digesting much fiber here in these high energy diets. And so again, we aren't releasing that, that energy and so that lowers, lowers that heat increment. So we do have some feedlot consultants now that are actually lowering the energy. They'll have a, the same storm diet they use in the winter, they, may use in the, they might use in the summer to cut that metabolic heat load. Uh, this is a, a CSI type study, had two or three thousand head of cattle lost in central Kansas, thought it was Zelmax or Optiflex and they wanted somebody to come in and figure out if that was really the case. And so I went in and we made a bunch of measures and looked at a lot of things and turned out it, the, the, the beta agonist wasn't really a contributing factor. They lost 
nearly 3% of the steers, over 3% of the heifers. 47% of the deaths occurred in south and west facing pens. And they only con constituted less than a quarter percent of the total cattle. So back to the solar heat load. That radiant heat pounding down on that in south and west facing pens raised that, that surface temperature enough, just enough, to cause those animals to be compromised at about twice the rate as what the, the east and, and north facing pens were. We did get, get some benefit from increasing the number of animal or the pen space. I've studied most of these. I studied about all of them in one way or the other. I'm working doing some work with essential oils now. You know, there's no magic bullets out there. If there's a magic bullet, it's water. And the cooler, the better. You don't want it ice cold, but the cooler, the better. Uh, but there are some things that have some, some ability, opportunity to work here uh, under the right conditions. But those are really hard to find, and chances are you've been able to match the right product with the right conditions are, is probably going to be limited or small. But, but again, I could go in each one of them and show you where they might, may or may not work. I've spent a lot of time looking at indicators, developing indicators. I was involved in developing that one, that one. This is the one I developed solely uh, on my own, or my own shop. These are all for heat stress. This is, will cover the whole spectrum from cold stress to heat stress. And the reason I like it is because I can move, I can track the animal, look at adaptation as he goes through one season or another. And so, uh, the, uh, it accounts for for temperature, humidity, wind speed, the solar radiation components that I talked about earlier. Uh, the Mesonet people over in uh, at the at o Oklahoma State, they work out of the OU Climate Center. Uh, they've put together a chart that charts that index, and th and also designed this to where it would give you numbers that are physiologically realistic. So if it says it's 104, it feels like about 104 within, within limits. But anyway, the unique thing is, is when I, start seeing, when I start seeing these conditions, then we've got a situation where animals that are in the feedlot under high energy diets could potentially be compromised, or some dairy animals, if they're out in the open, again, shade, Ventilation, fans, wind, whatever will, will modify this. So yesterday was situation. Chris, are you our next speaker? No. After the break. But anyway, he was showing me some things that that uh, talking about a situation in Texas yesterday. So I went to yesterday's map, and this whole area here was between 104 and 113. So yeah, it was it was perfect for some cattle to 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 have perished. So. This isn't, I, I can access this, but it isn't known by the public where this site is. But the Mesonet site for Oklahoma in itself, you can always get that from, uh, from, from that uh, uh, website. I use that index. I got a model to calculate death losses. And, you know, after listening to Candace and, and others this morning, I said, well, I'll, I'll just put this up for good measures. I think we really get the benefit of the doubt relative to how we're interpreting some of our animal welfare laws. And if somebody really wanted to put it to us, they could just go to the, the, the legal documents. And this is the one for Nebraska. And this is relative to the death loss, environmental death loss. Cruelty and neglect means to fail to provide any animal in one's care, whether as owner or custodian with food, water, or other care. It is reasonably necessary for the animal's health. So if I got 5,000 head of cattle dying or five head of cattle dying, I'm not so sure. And I knew, I knew I could have prevented it. Or 5,000 chickens, where's Karen? <laughs> or 200 pigs in a, in a poorly ventilated barn. I knew there's a way to prevent it. Now, again, I'm not saying it's going to be economically feasible to do that. But there's, there's plenty of laws on the books today that could get a person in pretty serious trouble if somebody really wanted to, 
to, to push it. So I think with that, yeah, that's basically what we've been saying most of the day. Who's going to decide what the rules are and who's going and how we're going to abide by them? So I'd entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, would you give me your opinion on uh, solid shape versus the canvas or uh, right. fabric shape? The question was on whether to use solid shade or fabric shade. If you look at sage shade structures in themselves, the, the more solid they are, the better they'll hold up under other environmental conditions, snow, wind, whatever. Uh, the solid, I prefer not to be totally solid. I want gaps in there. It's like a windbreak. Windbreak, we like to have 10 to 15% of a gap to allow some wind to go through and to allow some air movement to allow things to dry out. Uh, but a solid shade today might cost you, if, you know, if you're using a good steel, 10, 100, maybe $125 a head. Whereas I can put up a, a uh, uh, fabric maybe for 50 or $70 a head. So that's what you're dealing with. Uh, but even those solid structures, I've seen some structures go down with 80 mile straight winds in Dodge City, Kansas, or 100, whatever it might be. Yes, sir. Hey, yeah, this is really For mitigation, the question is for mitigation for winter stress? Yeah. Yes, that's another presentation, <laughs> uh, but there is. You can get into bedding, you can get into windbreaks, you can get into also the ration, the diet, the feeding system. Uh, generally, it's just like with heat stress, those animals that are within about 45 days of slaughter, they can go off feed and you just can't hardly get them back on. Probably. One more question, yeah. that's it. Yes. You, you talked. You said that that uh, beta agonist had no had no effect. Did you actually do study with without beta agonist involved or? Right. The, the, the question was on beta agonist. Well, on this analysis, we just went in, looked at their rations, their pens. We weren't exactly able to compare apples to apples on this analysis, but based upon, I'll say, reasonably sound statistical procedures, we could sort that out or at least identify the major factors. It did not come in. Actually, one of the beta agonists, I don't recall what one, it actually looked a little better in this. However, since then, I'm aware of two other studies, and there may be a third at OSU, that they are not able to find anything relative to adverse effects of those products being fed in the summer relative to dead animals, death loss. And, and again, I'm out in, uh, they couldn't find anything relative to mobility issues that was significant, if I recall that data. So again, it's, it's uh, uh, and, and then I, I did some work with, uh, with Merck. We got body temperature on some cattle up in Idaho. It wasn't the most ideal conditions because it's a high desert climate that's pretty dry. On that analysis, we basically, i seen a gradual increase. It's small. I mean, I'm talking about one or two tenths of body temperature by about the second week for cattle on beta agonist, about day 10, actually. And then, as they went through that feeding period, by the end of the study, that body temperature was below the controls. So, on the average, it was about the same. But, it's my opinion. <laughs> there's, there's some, there's some, met, there's some metabolic flux going there, and some um, uh, significant changes in t t tissue depots and and uh, redirection of of, of uh, I'm not finding the right word that that certainly could influence that metabolic flux, elevate that body temperature a little bit. But we're not seeing we're really in the scientific studies we're not seeing anything relative to the heat stress. And I actually thought maybe it ought to be used in winter cold stress, but I never could get anybody to fund that. So anyway, I better go. Uh, yeah. Thank, Thank you, Terry.